so the first question that we had come in was, is there any data on manure used to fertilize almonds or pistachios? And Lisa, if you want to take a crack at that, that'd be fabulous. Okay, sure thing. Um, so it's um, not uncommon for the growers to use manure as a soil amendment and fertilizer, um, although in response to the salmonella outbreaks, it's uh, contraindicated by the almond board. Um, they do say if you choose to use the manure, make sure it's well composted and aged. Uh, don't put it on uh, or allow at least 120 days from the time you apply it till harvest time. Um, doing trace back, uh, the almond industry has identified um, harvest and shelling as the parts along the production chain that are most likely to introduce the pathogen into the nut. Um, they know that in rainy conditions, the pathogen can seep through the shell into the nut. Uh, a lot of the harvest is done by shaking the nuts onto the ground and then collecting them off of the ground so they can, uh, they have ground contact and then if it's rainy, it can seep in. And then the other place where the, they feel there's the highest likelihood of the nuts becoming contaminated is during the shelling process, which um, if, the, if the, the pathogen's on the outside of the shell, during shelling some dust is generated and that's a time when the pathogen can be introduced onto the raw nuts. There have been a number of um, procedures introduced uh, to uh, um, reduce the pathogen after the nut has been shelled. There's some pasteurization processes that were develop developed by some ARS labs, so that's out there as a possibility. But um, oh yeah, that's that's more than your actual question, but that's a, that's the scoop on the nuts. Thank you so much. Um, and the next question was also for Lisa. And it says, I'm curious how much contamination of vegetable products and also meats has been attributed to just worker hygiene. Is there any documentation on that? Okay, so documentation, or let's say quantification of that. So there's anecdotal evidence out there, but, but actually quantifying that ends up being very difficult. Um, part of the challenge with any of these outbreaks is that um, you know, when you look at them together, it looks like, oh my goodness, there's a lot of outbreaks. When you look at the number of outbreaks compared to the amount of harvest that actually goes on, it's kind of a needle in the haystack. And so it's hard to do studies to track the, the, the pathogen when you don't quite know when it's going to show up. Um, that, that being said, this is a source that is on the radar from public health professionals. Um, there's been some studies looking at the role of um, providing latrines for um, field workers and uh, hand washing programs, and they'll measure the reduction of fecal indicator organisms. So they're not looking at the pathogen specifically, but just at general fecal indicator organisms, and they do see a reduction. Uh, so that suggests that there could be uh, and that could be uh, uh, a role. There could be a role for that as far as contamination goes. And then on the pathogen side of things, uh, there is uh, different thoughts depending on the different kinds of pathogens. So in general, if people get um, uh, salmonella, it can you can range from mild to severe. And so a lot of the disease is mild and you'd expect people to still be working even though they were actively shedding the pathogen. When people get ESTEC, in general, it tends to be very severe with bloody diarrhea and people would be much less likely to be able to drag themselves to work. Um, so the, the likelihood also uh, ha has somewhat something to do with the biology of the pathogen in, in people as well. So those are kind of the thoughts on that. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question came in more for Dustin, and the question is, in the late 1990s, while working with New York dairy farms, we were very concerned about cryptosporidium getting into water supplies in, that are supplying New York City. And that led to, led to the New York City continuing to date to pay dairy farms to install practices to reduce the risk of that pathogen. Is that still a concern for human drinking water, or why were we more concerned about that pathogen over the zoonotics that Lisa was talking about earlier? Yeah, so um, it, it, it is uh, still a concern. Um, 
And the, the highest risk, uh, as mentioned in the question, is dairy farms, just because the prevalence is so high. They have a consistent, uh, they have calves being born all the time, and so they always have this active uh, cryptosporidium um, issue going on in, in most of them. Um, yeah, so yes, it is, is this still an issue, especially if there's any risk of surface runoff? Uh, from a dairy farm or somewhere where dairy manure may have been applied. I think uh, John may have some things to add on this, but those um, outbreaks that had occurred in Milwaukee, I think, were related to dairy farm uh, surface runoff. Um, and we are more concerned about this for a few reasons. One is that OO cyst uh, has a very thick cell wall. Uh, drinking water, um, as you probably know, is has chlorine added to it to reduce microbial growth. That the uh, concentration of chlorine that's added to drinking water is not sufficient uh, to kill the um, cryptosporidium. And uh, that combined with a very low infectious dose makes this uh, probably one of the more higher risk uh, zoonotic pathogens. Uh, the good news is it, it's fairly mild, you know, but um, it, it can uh, infect a lot of people. For example, I, I put in the question box, there's been a, a semi-truck rollovers, I think they were in Kansas, where um, the first responders handled the calves, uh, and they almost all became infected just from that. Uh, there's been firefighters that have responded to barn fires, and they all, you know, two days or, uh, or a week or two later all came down with, um, with cryptosporidium. Uh, so so these, these can be very, um, can be very potent with, with just a small amount in, in exposure. All right, thanks, Dustin. Uh, next few questions here kind of go together, um, talking about food safety and those kinds of things. And the first one is, what cooking temperature is good for rendering pathogens safe in food? And I would hazard to guess that some that different, different pathogens will have a different cooking temperature. But the, the caveat to that next question, he also asks, um, so to be safe, should we never eat raw foods? What are your guys' recommendations on that? Uh, this is John. Um, as a microbiologist, I would uh, never uh, eat raw meats. Um, you know, as far as vegetables, uh, of course, you know, we always, we do eat raw vegetables such as spinach and, and lettuce and whatnot, but uh, certainly raw meats, I would definitely not eat raw meats. I'm not a proponent of those. Uh, uh, but uh, as far as cooking temperatures, I mean, you're looking at uh, in general for chicken 165 uh, I think pork is somewhere up there too um, beef is a little bit lower because there's a little bit of, uh, uh, different uh, uh, method of cooking that where you have uh, uh, contamination on the outside of the beef and of course the idea is that you are cooking the outside part of the beef and the inside part is not contaminated though if you took a knife you could potentially transfer the 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 pathogen from the outside of the uncooked beef to the inside of the uncooked beef and therefore of course you have a risk there and, and uh, we all know that there's uh, recommendations for ground beef as well uh, uh, cooking temperatures uh, to get it above there but uh, um, you know in general I'd, I'd say it's about 165 uh, for the most part all right um, another Semi-related question is, can the body, can the human body develop an immunity, or actually can animals develop an immunity to many pathogens? Um, I, would, I would say the answer is yes to some of them, but is that possible for all pathogens? Yeah, so uh, I can handle the animal part. I, I guess humans are animals too, so. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, yeah, they, they, they do. And um, where, where that becomes an issue is, for example, uh, John talked about norovirus. That's uh, sort of notorious for um, they're having a, so much diversity that um, you can have immunity to one type, but there's a thousand others that you're still susceptible to. And the same, the same for rotavirus in humans uh, or in animals, uh, where they, they may be exposed and get immunity to one one type or species of rotavirus, but uh, they're different enough immunologically that that you're still uh, susceptible to other types. All right, the other one I see here, and they're two kind of related. Is it safe to say that all soils have pathogens and then 
Um, the, the other one is, can, is land application of gypsum an effective treatment for manure-borne pathogens? And I know Dustin had, had tried to pass this one off to Amy, and I don't know if Amy is um, still listening to the webinar or not. Um, if she is, feel free to chime in, Amy. Um, but is that an effective treatment, or uh, also, do all soils have pathogens? Do, are all pathogens a problem, or all micro, microbes a problem? Um, I, I, I don't know if anyone else wants to take that, but I, mean, I guess I could answer a couple of those things. Um, yeah, so in general, I suppose you could make a broad assumption and say that if I took a gram of soil, I would probably find some sort of pathogen in it, whether it's uh, uh, an overt, uh, highly pathogenic organism that, that can do some major damage to you, or it's just a minor opportunistic pathogen. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say that in general, yes, there are pathogens in just about all soil. Um, there's really no such thing as pristine soil. Now, saying that, uh, the pathogens that we discussed here specifically, uh, like the ones Lisa discussed and, and, and Dustin and myself, those pathogens, no, you wouldn't necessarily find them in, in every soil. Um, you know, now that could be down to our detection limits, uh, but uh, you wouldn't necessarily find them in every uh, soil type that you've ever looked at or, or touched. But generally, yes, there's probably a pathogen in every soil. Um, the other thing, uh, uh, gypsum, yeah, we, we, we work with gypsum in our research uh, down here in Mississippi. Um, and what we have found is that gypsum will reduce uh, runoff of these pathogens in manure. Uh, so we've seen that with E. coli, with Enterococcus, we've seen that gypsum does reduce the runoff, but it's not necessarily killing them, it's just reducing their potential to move, probably because the gypsum is binding up uh, the pathogens and holding them a little tighter uh, to where they're uh, located near the soil, rather than making them available for any sort of horizontal transport via runoff. Um, but it doesn't necessarily kill them. Um, unless there's some sort of exothermic reaction involved in the gypsum. And, uh, that has to do with the types of gypsums that you play around. But um, otherwise, no, we, we wouldn't say that it's going to kill them, but it will hold them in place. Uh, so that, that's one sort of answer there. Um, Leslie, this is Amy. I am still on here, although I'm not able to see the question. So my only comment that I would add to that um, and I guess the reason Dustin would have um, suggested that I provide some input is that we've, you know, been looking at um, lime addition to manure or, and or soil as a method for controlling uh, the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, which is an enteric coronavirus. And we have found that um, raising the pH of the manure using lime um, is effective. Um, we we raised pH to 10 and held it for one hour, and we were um, found that that effectively um, took care of, of PEDV, but we are fairly confident that a lower pH would be effective as well. So um, that's the only added um, input I could um, offer regarding Lyme addition. Thank yeah. you. Actually, like, yeah, I can add a little bit more about lime too. I mean, the question, I guess, is about gypsum, but um, yeah, the lime, yes, lime is definitely a great addition for uh, killing off pathogens because it is a pH-driven uh, uh, thing. As it's also an exothermic-driven uh, reaction as well in some cases. Uh, but uh, the wastewater treatment plant industry has used lime for decades uh, as a method to. Uh, uh, reduce pathogens in raw sludge uh, down to biosolid level of, of quality. Uh, so it is one of their recommended approaches. Uh, two hours uh, at pH of 10 to 12 uh, shows reductions of viruses, 99.9% uh, 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 reduction in viruses, uh, parasites, uh, and also uh, certainly bacteria, forelog uh, reductions there. So it's, it's definitely a proven technique. And we've shown it too in our runoff studies uh, here as well. 
All right. And the last question we have as of right now, unless someone asks something more, is if a farmer is spreading fresh chicken manure on peach orchards, how many days are needed until the peaches could be harvested? And they're questioning also, is this a high risk practice? Yeah, I, I guess I don't know. I, I know that, you know, you can compost it and it, you know, can reduce pathogen burden. Um, but maybe Lisa has an idea. I assume they'd be concerned about maybe salmonella and campylobacter. I'm not sure about the environmental persistence of those pathogens in, in fresh manure. Yeah, this is Lisa. Yeah, I, I don't know about how many days would be needed. And um, I think uh, it depends on uh, what part of the um, production cycle you're in. If you're applying fresh manure and the peaches are just about ready to be harvested, then there's lots of opportunities for cross-contamination, either directly or through aerosolization of the manure. And, but without knowing more about peach production and the specifics of the, um, um, of the harvest procedure, it, it's hard for me to say. Yeah, this is John. I, yeah, I agree with Lisa on that. Um, uh, when we do our littered application uh, here, what, what we see is, uh, generally speaking, the, the pathogens in the litter, um, the, they die off relatively quickly. Uh, but it uh, depends on, on what stage in production. If they're going to harvest uh, two days later after application, uh, of course, that's an increased risk uh, there, even if one salmonella is persisting in uh, the litter. But, um, you know, we for what we have seen, uh, uh, here when we land apply it uh, and, and given enough sunlight, um, uh, the litter is, is, is fairly safe after a few weeks. Um, but, you know, it just it, it depends on what stage of production we're referring to. All right. I don't see any more. Well, no, I do have one more question here. Going back to the, the gypsum and lime discussion, uh, Rick mentions Raising pH of manure, though, releases ammonium and ammonium gas. Is this a concern? Yeah, so uh, our uh, emissions expert here in Mississippi, um, you know, she does monitor a lot of the ammonia released as a result of lime addition. And uh, of course, it's, it's a big issue if you were to do it in the poultry house, if you did it to the chicken litter, for example. Uh, that's where the issue is really big. Uh, as far as out in the environment, if you're land applying it and you're adding um, uh, lime prior to land application, the ammonia that you're losing, of course, that makes the litter less effective as a soil amendment. Uh, so that's one consideration. Uh, so, uh, but it, yes, it does happen, and that's factored in. And um, I would add to that, Leslie. Uh, we did, you know, we measured pH or we measured ammonia loss when we were um, doing our trials on addition of lime to manure for um, the PEDV virus. And um, yeah, that, you know, we had a lot of the majority of the ammonia um, volatilized out of the manure. And that's one of the reasons when we talked to producers about using lime addition to their manure. Uh, as a biosecurity measure, um, we tell them not to, you, you absolutely don't want to do that in the pit of the building. Um, if you're going to do it, we would say add it in the um, tank wagon if you're hauling manure in that way. Otherwise, um, it, it'd probably be best to do lime application to the soil prior to uh, manure application. Great, thanks. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions, and we have used up all of our time. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and I want to thank our presenters especially for, for their wonderful presentations and for answering everyone's questions to the best of their ability.